everyone. Welcome back to Practically Intelligent. Today we're excited to welcome Jacob Solowitz, uh, the CTO at RC.ai and former founding engineer at Roboflow, one of the leading companies in computer vision infrastructure. We're going to talk to Jacob a bit about trends in vision and how the evolution of vision transformers and now uh, multimodal architectures could be different than how LMs progressed or more of the same. I think I really like Jacob's balance because he's now working on a company that's domain adapting LMs, but has had years of experience working in making usable and functional and deployable vision models for various different use cases. Um, I like his balanced perspective on both, so we're excited to have him on. Yeah, no, it's a great conversation. We 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 talk. It's it's one of those episodes where we talk not just about the technological improvements, but we're also really hitting on how those improvements end up affecting the interaction between users and AI. And I think that's really where people are excited about multimodal because it's it's really the future of how we're going to interact with these systems. So I say we jump right in. Hey, Jacob, how's it going? Going great. How are you guys? I'm doing great. Actually, how are you? I'm hoping you're over um, here when I do this. I'm, I'm pretty thrilled. You, pretty I, thrilled. I am, we love I'm, that. I am, on, I am on the left side of the scene. If, great. If not, we, could, <laughs> we, could, we could use uh, the new emu moment. Editor, please make that work. Or honestly, make me look like an idiot. It's also fine. <laughs> uh, today, we have Jacob on. We are going to be talking pretty much all things multimodal and computer vision. because Not just because it is actively kind of a hot topic, but because Jacob is actually one of the, uh, in my opinion at least, one of the pioneering engineers in the modern computer vision space, uh, being the founding engineer of RoboFlow. And just yesterday, by the way, I, this is breaking news. Yesterday I was giving a lecture for O'Reilly on the topic of GPT. And one of the questions was, did you see this new uh, webcam GPT demo from RoboFlow? And they sent me the GitHub link. And I'm like, that's so funny. I'm talking to the founding engineer tomorrow about this are about, you know, his work and what he's been up to. So this is something people are talking about more and more. So Jacob, my first question to you to kind of open us all up to this space is, can you give us kind of a brief history? Where have we been? Where are we now? Uh, and then we'll get to where are we going a uh, bit later on. But where, where have we been? Where are we now in computer vision and multimedia? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think that's an exciting place to kick things off. So um, obviously, you know, everything in the AI world is moving forward right now. It's a lot of rapid velocity, but in CV, the most exciting thing is multimodality, which is, you know, bringing in the ability to have language understanding in combination with images and video in a way that we've never been able to do that before. So kind of taking, taking a, a high level step back into that landscape is the history of CV was, you know, People were doing old school ML algorithms like 10 years ago and working on processing pixels. And then they eventually collapsed on the CNN. And so we had, you know, convolutional neural networks and exciting uh, models like YOLO come out and make a really big impact. And YOLO and ResNet was kind of the dominant models in CV for, you know, about, uh, you know, from five years ago to about, yeah, maybe like a year ago now when uh, you know, transformers really started to make a big impact and start to set uh, new heights in, in benchmarks. And so there's kind of an inter interesting mixing of waters now where you have a lot of practical applications still running on CNN models and, uh, and a lot of new exciting applications coming out uh, that are more general on, uh, with multimodality. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up a lot of that history because... Uh, users or users, <laughs> listeners will will know. I I tend to be uh, an expert in all things text based, um, and you know NLP. But that doesn't mean I don't understand computer vision. I don't know the history of computer vision models. And I think part of what makes it such a similar story, a similar arc, and we'll, again, this will all kind of converge with multimodality. Is while the NLP researchers and practitioners were over here you know, figuring out, you know, not figuring out, but using attention mechanisms, attaching them onto recurrent neural networks to make them a little bit better. Um, and, and then finally figuring out that, hey, maybe, you know, quote, attention is all you need and the transformer. A very similar thing was happening in vision, honestly, pretty much at the same time. 
you see in the mid 20 teens, 2016, 2017, I think it was you at all. If I, I'll have to remember this, but papers were already coming out with people attaching the attention mechanism to CNNs to make better image captioning systems. So we were all we were using the the primary engine of the transformer, the attention mechanism, even before the transformer came out in computer vision and in NLP. And when the transformer comes out in 2017, it's only preceded a few years later with the quote vision transformer in 2020, a paper that comes out of Google. So we see that's also the same year that GPT-3 comes out and that starts to get in the news. So vision and, and NLP have always been within, you know, two to five years of each other in the state of progress. So NLP came out a little bit ahead just because OpenAI put that really nice user interface on top of their LLM. But more importantly, and I think this kind of leads me to my next uh, question to you is, the data was already there with text. Text data is just stupid easy to find, right, on the open internet. But well-labeled image data, not so much. So we had our, a big delta in, in data set quality was with ImageNet from like a, a half a decade to a decade ago at this point. And that really spurned the idea of pre-trained networks like ResNet, but all convolutional. So my, my, my first question now back to you is, how do you kind of see those parallel tracks going? And now that we're seeing this, you know, explosion of vision models, like you, you mentioned Donut and, you know, uh, Flamingo and Vision Transformer in the last two to three years, what does that signal about the state of computer vision uh, compared to the state of like NLP with chat, with chat GPT? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that is kind of an interesting way to see things is that a, a big thing was just the the prevalence of a huge corpus of labeled data. And the nice thing about that was because, you know, NLP pre-training routines were able to just find out that next token prediction worked pretty well to kind of get a deeper semantic understanding, which next pixel prediction never really seemed to pan out that way. So uh, that, that just happened to be, you know, a, a nice artifact of the way that uh, language carries semantic richness in a way that uh, just image pixels maybe doesn't quite have. I mean, maybe if we had like infinite data of video streams of different, you know, next pixel in the next time time frame, maybe it would, maybe it would have worked differently. Um, so I, I do think I do think that's interesting. But I think yeah, I think the interesting thing is that you know, like NLP had all these really strong base models to to build things off of. You know, where people were making all kinds of applications on top of BERT when you know that first you know pre-train and then fine-tune. Uh, schema was was introduced and vision had things you know you could pre-train off or you could fine-tune off the uh, image net backbones and you know you were getting some semantic richness from pre-training on, on image net but you didn't really have like a really rich base like we have now so now there's these really exciting new models you know like uh, grounding dino and flamingo and you know some of these other other new models that are even coming out this week uh, that are exciting bases to, to be training from. So it seems like there is going to be kind of like a, you know, a Cambrian explosion, if you will, of uh, deep uh, vision applications that are, are built off these things. And, and not only that, um, I would say, which is, you know, with the ability to do uh, single shot and few shot prompting of these general CV models, there's all kinds of new applications that can be built by developers that have that kind of general ability that language has been shown to be, you know, making a lot, a lot of, you know, exciting new, new applications on top of that, which, which is really big, you know, if you don't have to spin up your own GPUs and you don't have to figure out how to, you know, orchestrate, you know, a thousand A100s in the cloud together to get a model out, um, you know, that, that, that's going to speed up the pace of things quite a bit. Yeah, I'm, I, I can see it now, the, the, the hit sequel to 101 Dalmatians, 101 GPUs, I think it's going to be a big hit. Uh, and AI can make the whole video eventually. But it's actually, I'm really glad you mentioned the the, the few shot learning because uh, that's actually, for me, almost a perfect analogy because the, the original name of the paper for GPT-3 was language models are few shot learners, right? Not introducing GPT-3. It was language models are few shot learners. That paper introduced GPT where the authors, opening eye, were saying that where you get the most interesting work is through the few shot learning. And this is 2020. Again, two years before they 
focused on alignment so that you didn't need few shot learning anymore. It just becomes, um, it, it just becomes ask it a question, get your answer. So it's that delta between we're seeing the promise to we've made it more user accessible. And I think between there, you get this explosion of research, you know, your Cambrian explosion of research, and then it all kind of culminates in here's how you now interact with this, this model. Uh, does that, is that, you know, I, that's how I see it at least. Akshay, like, what, what, what do you think? No, I think it's think similar things. I think one thing, Jacob, that your blog post actually from the CVPR conference up in Vancouver earlier this year touched on was there seemed to be two research tracks, which is um, a lot of research being presented as derivative of CLIP and essentially, you know, few shot learning from distilled CLIP models and newer applications of that, uh, borrowing from similar architectures. And then there seems to be a separate path um, from Grounding Dino, uh, Florence, um, and a few other models that, that, that Sanan has already mentioned. So it's, it's really interesting. I think there's, uh, even with this Cambridge explosion, there tends to be two sort of trees and lineages from which research is, is uh, presenting, which is a little dis bit distinct, Sanan, I think, from... You know, we basically had this seminal moment where we all realized, oh, shit, GPT and this tran single transformer architecture can essentially be replicated for, uh, you know, a thousand different things. There seems to be more diversity, Jacob, and and, uh, and part of this is maybe the image use cases can be different um, and multimodality has a variety of different data and use cases it can be applicable to. But there seems to be more uh, diversity um, in, in existing vision models and architectures than than language. Yeah, I'd say that definitely seems seems to be the case in, in many regards in that, you know, if you think about language applications, the chat interface is a pretty kind of dominant one where you just kind of put in language and then get language out. And there's a lot, a lot of different uh, applications that you can do with that. Whereas in vision, you know, there's a lot more specificity that people are looking for um, within identifying specific things within images and doing specific tasks with them. Um, and so yeah, so I actually think um, if that, that's kind of like a little bit of a segue into what I think is, is somewhat limited in some of the multimodal models now compared to uh, traditional CV techniques, which is like for very specific operations of machines and you know things where you need to be cutting very precisely or identifying an object's location. Um, things are, uh, I think it's it's been shown even, you know, GPT-4V doesn't really have that preciseness of being able to draw, you know, tight boxes or very close masks or, or things like this that people are usually using, uh, you know, traditional CV techniques for, um, which, which, I, which I think is, is, is interesting in that language, it seems like we can get it almost dead on now, but uh, vision that still seems like some of that precision in pixels is, is still to come. Yeah, I mean, an image is worth a thousand words, or in the in the words of Google, an image is worth uh, sixteen by sixteen words. I believe is the name of the paper for the Vision Transformer, or something like that. Um, that I mean, to me, that makes a lot of sense. the The user interface, the practicality, you know, if you will, of it all, really seems to dominate because uh, you know the chat interface is the dominant form to interact with LLMs, but it's not the only way to interact with an LLM, right? Access to open source auto encoding models like BERT mean you don't talk to it per se, but you can still train it to do the task you want to do, arguably for the most times cheaper and better at scale. But it does converge into this, well, this is how the consumer interacts with this product. And here's how the developer might interact with this ecosystem. And with vision, to your point, it's almost like we're still finding it. We still, we're still figuring out what is that mainstream consumer path? Because we, we seem to have all these different ways that developers can do, you know, editing or masking or segmentation or just even flat out detection can be spun off into a billion dollar, you know, a company alone for the most part. But we still don't know what that middle track is. Is it GPTV? Potentially, is it all just a chat interface? I hope not, but maybe. Um, but that we still are figuring that out. Um, is that kind of how you see it, Jacob, or, or is that? Totally, I agree. I, I think yeah, it's kind of the wild west what the what that middle ground is going to be. Um, I actually don't necessarily. I don't think I even have any speculations. Actually, maybe you guys. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, me neither, right? Because, you know, we talk about multimodality, and maybe this is the perfect segue. Um, but we talk about multimodality a lot. And my experience, I don't know about you two, but my experience, people will come to me and be like, what do you think about multimodality? And then they'll follow up with, you know, like GPTV, like images and text together. And I'm like, and I have to kind of look at them and go, yeah, it's really exciting. And don't forget, multimodality, one of the examples of multimodality is text and images. But the term multimodality is so vague, it literally just means any combination of two or more modes of data. You can have a, 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 a model that knows audio and video only. You can literally only talk to it, but it produces videos. That would be technically a multimodal model that does not require any, quote, texting, depending on how you do the image processing. But uh, that's something I have to kind of walk people up to. So in, in, in your mind, uh, I, I'm kind of curious about two things. The Where are we with multimodality as a field, both from a kind of consumer standpoint and a research standpoint? And maybe let's start with the research standpoint, because I, I'm more interested because research tends to kind of get ahead of consumers a little bit. So where are we? do you think in the research field of just kind of multimodality in general? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't have maybe the best calibration on, on the very cutting edge of this, but it definitely seems, it definitely makes sense. If you, if you think about just kind of like if you're building a general intelligence that this general intelligence should be fed from many different modes of, of, of data. And so, you know, the exciting thing with the connection of text and images, because those are the ones that are most prevalent on the web, is kind of an exciting initial connection where we've seen a lot of good progress coming in. Uh, but I think there's definitely been a lot of uh, interesting research that people have been doing with transformers to try to continue to figure out how can we create this unified inf an interface between, uh, you know, whatever the data modality is, you know, so an image is just, you know, like what you said, like a 16 by 16 batch of, of sequences. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, maybe the way that audio manifests itself and taste or all these other different modalities are the same thing. And you can get that all into the same uh, model, which, which I think is exciting. And um, I don't know, is this, does this fall into what you were talking about with the idempotent generative network? Is that in this line of work or is it? Yeah, kind of, I think. Um, so before, Again, peek behind the curtains. We talked before the recording as well. Um, Google released a paper early November 2023, a couple of weeks ago at this point, uh, two weeks ago at this point, right? So long ago. Uh, and, and the paper was called IGN, Item Potency, uh, Item Potency Generative Networks. And it is, to my knowledge, and um, you know, having read the paper and kind of walked through a little bit about what they're talking about, the idea is that maybe transformers aren't, you know, kind of pure vision transformers aren't necessarily the only path forward here, right? I still argue transformers are not the end of the story for NLP in general. They just are the biggest delta that we've had in a very long time. But it's not the end of the story, or it, it very likely is not. Computer vision is the same. And, and even now we're talking about all the different models not all of them are technically pure transformers or even pure vision transformers. There's already so much diversity, as I think actually you were talking about earlier, in the architecture. So when Google puts out you know, a paper, and I kind of nerded out a little bit just because my master's is in algebraic geometry. So I'm, I'm reading words like manifolds and target, uh, target manifolds in the, uh, in the function, you know, item potency. I'm like, oh, I remember all these terms from intro algebra <laughs> in my master's class. But like that's kind of the point is like well you know where the research is talking at this level of mathematical rigorousness that is still trickling down. So it's always fun for yeah. me in a way to see like wow like this what an interesting math function all the way to oh right but stable diffusion does it this way and that's the most efficient right now but here's where we are. Um, and that gap between the research and the consumer is what I, I like to think about a lot. Uh, and, and kind of what becomes adopted. So I think that speaks to your point, though, is, well, where's the data? Where's the where's the use case? And where's the scalability, right? Yeah, Jacob, it's, it's interesting. I think that, Son, you're touching on something really interesting, which is all this research, until there was a clear, crystal clear uh, consumer use case 
that mm-hmm. made people aware of potential downstream applications, people weren't really paying attention, right? And so, Jacob, I'm, I'm kind of curious, right? I think in many ways, multimodality, it is multi. There are multiple different applications of this. People are familiar with the mid-journey and visual prompting examples. It'd be kind of interesting to walk through, given your background overflow, I, I'm asking this for people in LMs. What are the four main use cases for LLMs in four years, right? And that, I think, can help infrastructure startups, can help people conceptualize. There's co-pilots, there's chatbots, there's transcription, you know, there's a bunch of different applications, but there are four to five really key ones. I think it might be interesting given you saw what people were building with RoboFlow and Mm -hmm. also seeing these different architectures, what are the four to five main applications of multimodality that you've already seen and are seeing that has you really psyched about that are kind of uh, maybe just beyond the kind of visual, you know, create an image of, of uh, you know, a dog running through a, fo- a field or create my logo. Um, what are other use cases that you, you're pretty psyched about? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So, yeah, so I guess kind of as you, as you put there, yeah, maybe with language models, we feel like we've kind of started to see the collapse of uh, the different different forms that, that they would be utilized for. Um, but, but yeah, with, with multimodal vision models, maybe it's, it's not so clear yet. And the nascent applications are yet yeah, the visual prompting. And so you, so you can chat with the image or chat with the, the scene and then the, um, the image generation. So you can actually just generate new images. And, and those two seem to be kind of like the first, uh, leaders in this. Um, but yeah, then crossing that with my experience at, at RoboFlow, I think is pretty interesting. So there, um, I mean, it was predominantly uh, detection cases. So um, the, the number one use case on RoboFlow Universe, which has, you know, some 400,000 models on it now, is pothole detection. So uh, everybody just wants to know if there's potholes on the street that they're driving down. And everybody wants to know that throughout the entire world. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it has the civic, uh, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure people are still going to want to do that one. Uh, but in terms of how multimodality plays into that, I think, um, you know, I think the, the biggest promise of multimodality is to be able to connect the, you know, AI understanding layer that you have with the neural network with the, with the real world. So just in the way, you know, that uh, OpenAI released GPTs with the really strong promise of being able to orchestrate all these APIs that are operating, you know, the web is if you can reach one level lower and you're starting to operate, you know, mechanical processes in the physical world, um, that seems to be kind of like the most promising thing about uh, about multimodal that you could have, which is like a, a multimodal machine that you could say just like, you know, I want you to clean my bathroom floor and it knows what the bathroom floor is. It knows where it is. It goes over there and it does, does the task. So I think that's, I think there's going to be a lot of exciting uh, merging of that through multimodal as people that are working on uh, multimodal combinations with, with, with robotics. Um, so if, if there's someone out there looking on the podcast right now, looking for a startup idea, I think that that, that one's pretty exciting. I completely agree. I don't know if you all saw the like DeepMind RT2 model. Uh, it, was, it was super interesting. Um, I was chatting with a friend over at Boston Dynamics, um, Jacob, who was also talking exactly about this, which is literally the entire field of robotics has spent so much time trying to encode semantic understanding of physical space and teach the robot, the room is messy. This is what a you know paper cup looks like, et cetera. Now go pick that up. And the last mile has literally been, you know, programming that hardware um, to, to con- you know, basically instruct it to do specific tasks. Um, RT2 is quite interesting because it was DeepMind basically showing exactly that, which is if you know what a pothole is or if you know what a um, what messy is and can deconstruct that from language to visual examples, you can instruct in you know, for the physical world, someone just say someone go clean your room and just as a human would, a robot could understand and decompose that into different tasks. And so I think even beyond just like basic optimization, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, and, and maybe you, you, you remember this from the conference, I think people were most excited about um, 
particularly visual prompting for synthetic data use cases to actually teach uh, different, you know, physical world examples uh, to, to robots and, and basically accelerate their learning. So I actually think that subdomain is going to be uh, going to be a huge case. I couldn't couldn't agree more. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, coming I mean, now that we're on the topic of of uh, you know squarely in in use cases and practicality of multimodality, and I guess it's a, it's a big question, but and we've already started to answer it. But how, what kinds of kind of imminent use cases do you see as as uh, something more more like untapped? Like, Akshay and I were talking about this the other day at, at a coffee shop. We we're talking about use cases for multimodality. And we kind of came to a very similar conclusion, which we can think of ideas, but is it worth starting something now knowing that the architecture is so in flux or is it better to think more on what are the use cases that are okay now, but will only become better and, and kind of like a race between what's the better idea and what is the actual model architectures ready for today? So what kind of uh, what, what do you think are like the, the biggest applications today that can be solved that maybe people are are just starting to get into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think I guess immediately what's coming to mind there's no, nothing like a really really good like few single use cases that are, are really coming to mind. But I think there's um, a lot to be done. So there, there's obviously still a lot of use cases where you know your traditional CV methods like detection, segmentation, classification are going to be the best thing you can do to get high accuracy results and operate you know machines with the efficiency that that uh, we we want to. But there are a lot of applications that you know a multimodal model might be almost there that you can just bet on you know in six to the twelve months. That those models are just going to get stronger and your your application will end up becoming you know a very useful thing um, and you can kind of ride the tides of, of the the fact that these general models are just going to be getting a lot stronger um, so anything within those like couple first use cases that we talked about with visual prompting and an image gen definitely seems like you know a lot of exciting places to be building and the other nice thing there too is, you know, all the infra is getting put up around it, so you can build on top of the shoulders of giants for a lot of those applications. Um, it could be fun to kind of ideate on what some of those applications might be. But, uh, yeah, because like even I, I'm like, you know, I have uh, I have blank cameras in my in my house because my pets can be kind of rambunctious when I'm gone. Uh, and even I was like, well, blink, I can get access to the API. I can get images from my camera. I can run that through a thing. I can tell me what the cat is doing, what the dog is doing. And it's like, and then I'm like, well, if I can do that, then I can do this. If I can do that, then I can do this. And it feels like it's almost, it, it's really easy, I think, to come up with all of these ideas. But then it becomes like this, you know, almost like the diversity in architectures. There's this paradox of choice, which is like, Okay, but what's cool and what's interesting? What's interesting and what's profitable? What's profitable and what's you know not quite there yet? And you have this really multi-axis decision-making problem of where should I be focusing my time? But that kind of leads to a bigger question, which is like the modern quote-unquote chat GPT expert who is who is really just someone who is uh, really good at teaching and reading and writing and knows how to prompt really well. Um, they can get in and, and kind of make their fair share of splash in the space. What does that look like in computer vision? Like what, what, what does that look like? What is the, um, cause I think the big thing for me was always the avatars, right? Upload your face, like dream booth, all your, upload your face and we're going to make, you know, chibi you, we're going to make uh Marvel you, we're going to make, you know, Renaissance painting of you. And it was fun. But then I saw like 50 of them and I'm like, okay, we get it. Uh, what are some of those like other like, like fun and interesting ideas? Or uh, let me put it, ask you a different way. That also leads to a different potential issue that I can see, which is a paper that I read out of Rice. Um, it was called like Ma Models Go Mad. And the, the acronym was like Model Autophagy Disorder. The idea was they were looking to data poisoning. As these applications keep cropping up that are making AI generated images, it kind of floods the space, the, the open internet, which, as we all know, becomes the source material for a lot of the next generation of AI models. 
And they showed that if you train AI models on increasingly larger amounts of synthetic images from previous generations of models, the models tend to not get better, but actually get worse in quality over time. And it becomes this tricky issue of like, well, we have to spend more time on data processing. I guess, how do you see that cycle of generating? I mean, the same thing for text too, but images specifically, how do you see that kind of self-feeding, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy and like feedback loop developing? Yeah, that's interesting. I wasn't familiar with that paper that it... It, uh, it was a couple months ago. I honestly just came to mind. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> it seems like it would be like a at least steady, like it would just be regurgitating upon itself and kind of staying steady. But if it's, maybe you're like losing resolution at every, every step. Like, it's always like, the way they describe it was the previous generations have imperfections that later generations kind of exploit and like make bigger. So yeah. like the problem of uh, image generating model giving me six fingers becomes like eight fingers down the road. It's like, it just kind of gets worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's, too kind of like a promising fact uh, that we can have some consolation in and that like we like us humans still have something to do you know we still need to create and generate new content that's worthwhile for for the the, the models of tomorrow to be learning from um which which i do think is, is an interesting uh, fact about you know this whole, whole ai thing which is some people feel like we're kind of like totally out of a job but uh you know there's still a lot of interesting things for 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 us to do you can always uh, create content that's it's the, there's solace in that yeah. thing. <laughs> for better or for worse humans can always create content <laughs> whether people want us to or not we'll be creating content so uh, yeah, he uh, said as his listeners turned off the podcast <laughs> um but you're you're raising a great point jacob because you know with the sag uh strike that just ended recently a big point of that strike with with you know screen actors and, and writers as well is AI generated content. And you know, I'm not an expert in economics, I'm not an expert in, in strike philosophy. And I do know that and believe and know that AI is actively uh, uh, replacing some jobs. But to your point, the, the fear around, oh my God, the AI is here and it's already better than humans. That's the point that I want people to kind of forget. It's like, that's not the argument. The bad part isn't the AI is better than humans. The part is the AI is actually not as good as humans, but companies still want to use them. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the answer isn't great. Well, then we'll wait for AI to get better. No, the answer is what you said, I think, which is humans will always need to play a role. Otherwise, humans are not progressing. We are not creating anything new. We are just relying on AI systems to kind of cut, paste, put things together of stuff we've already done which up till now is a lot, but it shouldn't be all of what we've done. So there's always going to be this tricky conversation to have. And it's a lot of it's economics, a lot of it's research, and a lot of it is just human nature and navigating all that. But I, I like what you said very succinctly, which is what I'm saying very unsuccinctly, which is humans will always have a part to play. And, and, and for me, that's a wonderful philosophy to kind of walk away with from a lot of this conversation. Do you, th do you think so? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Good. Yeah. Well, you heard it here first. Thing... Humans will always have a part to play. <laughs> it's content, everyone. The, uh, the um, one thing, Son, you, you mentioned, which is humans will always have a part to play, is that I think we're actually in the middle of maybe the biggest upskilling that we've had uh, you know, in, in technical talent ever, which is that everyone's learning how to become a new developer with LLMs in this mm -hmm. new interesting world. And Jacob, something I think it's interesting is we have this whole new audience of folks that don't have a background in ML that are functionally creating new applications and they're running into challenges, which are obvious to those that you like Sanan with a background in NLP that, hey, this is non-deterministic to, to create a data pipeline, you're gonna have to structure your output. Hey, it turns out distilling these models is quite hard and for you to get performance out of that relative to cost, you need to do that. So these dis distinct infrastructure challenges that have popped up that engineers are dealing with with LMs and trying to figure out. For multimodality, I'd ask you, what are people going to run into when they when this starts uh, becoming more mature, right? Given your, your your time at Roboflow, you've probably seen this, and you're also seeing stuff come online, maybe get abstracted away. What are the one or two surprises that people will realize they'll have to deal with? Uh, obviously, everyone's GPU poor, so not having enough resources is the obvious one. But what maybe uh, interesting challenges will developers have to face as they learn how to develop multimodal applications? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, so I'm not 
officially still affiliated with RoboFlow, but it definitely feels like you just teed me up for this one. So um, <clears throat> one big thing about multimodal uh, computer vision models is they're huge. <laughs> so, you know, like that's the same thing with the uh, GPD models and things like that, you know, is like you, you have these huge models, they have huge general capacity and uh, they're very talented at many different things. But the, the problem with that is that your inference costs are ridiculous, right? So you have to spend a ton of money to send all your data through the GPUs necessary to, that, that you're gonna need to infer through these models and that will be quite costly. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, it's uh, like a lot of vision cases, you're actually inferring uh, at, a, at a rapid rate. So um, a big thing that RoboFlow does is like real-time inference. So you're inferring almost like 30 frames a second, and there's no way that you're gonna bring, you know, 175 billion parameter uh, multimodal vision model down, down to the edge. So a project that RoboFlow has been working on is uh, this project called AutoDistill. Uh, and AutoDistill, what it does is you can infer through multimodal models and use them to label supervision data sets and then distill them down into base models like detection and segmentation and classification models uh, that you can then deploy. And so those APIs are all very simple to use where you do the same thing where you prompt and then you quickly get a new smaller model off of it, which I think that's a really exciting uh, thing that people are going to be doing with multimodal models is uh, take them distill them down into kind of like that basic thing that you're trying to do and then operate it more efficiently. Um, and in, in some cases too, that you have it more accurately too, because you've been able to supervise the data set and uh, kind of can take the control back a little bit. Um, so Definitely. Yeah. That kind of, well, that's what people are going to be doing in a couple of years right now with LMs. They're having the same challenges, right? Which is uh, distilling those models, supervising and getting the right data. It actually kind of relates to the solving problem you're, you're now addressing in, in founding your new company, Jacob. So could you tell us a little bit more about uh, RC and, and what you all are up to? Yeah, yeah. So RC is kind of after a little bit of a similar routine where um, we're all about making specialized language models that are operating uh, within side of people's uh, VPCs and so that their data can stay private and they're working on specific use cases with language models. Um, so for example, you know, certain people are using language models to, you know, do things that we used to do like entity extraction and like uh, or, you know, classification or things like that, or um, different, you know, more like constrained NLP tasks. And I even do it all the time today where I'll just be like, okay, well, I want to get this thing done. What's the easiest way to do it? Llama 70 billion and send in a prompt and, you know, spin up a ton of GPUs and uh, process those, those desires that I have. But really, you know, if you want to operate some of these models at uh, lower cost, then best thing to do is distill them down, focus on a domain or a task, and then kind of deploy a, a smaller model to do those things. So that's kind of the area of, uh, of work that I'm working in now, um, which is in, in a lot of ways similar in spirit uh, to uh, the distillation of multimodal models to a CV model. Yeah, no, it's more the same. It's, it's the right data and getting it into a usable format that matches your use case, right? So I think we're going to see more and more of that. Sonan and I already have talked to that as a theme. So we'll link to uh, either the company and your all product in, yeah. in, in the links. But Jacob, thank you so much for taking time. This was super fun. So thanks for coming on. Yeah. We'll, uh, we really, really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Love, love doing things like this. And yeah, had a great time myself as well. Awesome. We'll see you soon. Yep. See you guys.